uh, Monday, August 10th business meeting. We we're going to do a roll call to ensure that all the board members are, are here. So I'll go through the names. Just acknowledge that you're on the call. Uh, Barry Shoemaker. I'm here. Carolyn Carpenter. I'm here. Cindy Furtenbaugh. Here. David Harrison. Present and accounted for. Molly Grimsley. Here. Laura Blackwell. Here. And myself, Rob Walter. I'm here. Um, our superintendent on the line. Chris Slaughter. Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay. And then our uh, teacher of the year, Emily Wagner, are you on, on as well? Yes, I'm here as well. Fantastic. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started by adopting our agenda. The agenda is on the board docs. Um, you've all had time to review that. And if we're uh, ready to adopt our agenda, I'd need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. So motion by Mr. Harrison. Second by Ms. Furtenbaugh. All in favor of approving our motion, our agenda tonight, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, that motion passes. We have our agenda set. And the first <clears throat> item on the agenda here is the approval of the August 10th personal recommendations and our closed session minutes. So item 5.01 is the uh, call for motions to approve the uh, personal recommendations. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Harrison, a second by Ms. Blackwell. Any uh, di further discussion on our personnel recommendations? Okay, hearing none, we will uh, go ahead and vote. Everybody in favor of approving the personnel recommendations? Please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed, say no. Okay, that motion passes. And then we have one set of minutes. Uh, that was from, which date was that last week? July closed. July, July closed. Sorry, I'm on the wrong sheet. Any comments or questions on those minutes before we approve those? Motion to approve and hold them confidential. Second. Okay, so we have a motion to approve and hold the minutes confidential. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed say no? Okay, those uh, closed session minutes will are approved and will remain confidential. Um, we also have minutes from our July meetings. Okay. So that's the next item on the agenda, 6.01. It's the approval of the minutes from July 13th, our combined work session and business meeting, and then our July Wait. 23rd called meeting. Everybody had a chance to review those minutes? Sit down, Ellie. Mm -hmm. Sit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sit down, Ellie. <clears throat> Somebody's mic was left on. All right, uh, questions, comments, changes to those minutes? If not, we'd need a motion and a second to approve those. This is Carol Carpenter. I make a motion we approve those minutes. Second. So motion by Ms. Carpenter, second by Mr. Harrison to approve the uh, minutes from July 13th and July 23rd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed say no? Okay, those minutes pass. Um, moving on to our next item was board chair and superintendent comments. And board chair comments may be a discussion today. Um, <clears throat> two weeks ago, we approved our uh, motion to open our school on August 17th under option C. And the motion that we had would review every two weeks, essentially on the first Monday and the third Monday. Um, the third Monday comes up next week. We got some numbers from, from our superintendent today, which showed uh, pretty much steady as far as the, the three, the tracking of the number of cases here in Cabarrus County, the po percent positive and the hospitalizations. Essentially, he, he provided us numbers of 2703 total cases, which is an increase of 228. And he gave us a number of uh, hospitalizations at 53, which is essentially the same number as the prior week. And we don't really have the percentage positive number current, but the last number given was 7.74, and the goal, I think, was under 5%. Um, with that being said, do we want to meet next week, or what, what process do we want to put in place to so the board can continue to review our status? Hey, guys, this is Holly. I need to, I'm just getting in here, so I just want to make sure I'm clear, Rob, on those numbers. So that 51, and I'm not sure who's online to answer this, 
what what number of that is just Cabarrus County residents? I had asked that from now on when we get that, that we get the just Cabarrus County residents that are in that, the hospital. That was, that was not provided in the email. Uh, I, 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 I said that's I'm the not last that. you, But that's on the website right now. You can pull the website up if you want to, or I can pull it up now. I'm on my phone, so could someone do that? That would be great. The good news on all that is the number of active cases has dropped substantially. It was over 682 two weeks ago. It now is reported at 463, so that's outstanding numbers. I hope that can continue. Mr. Chair? Yes. If you were opening discussions, uh, as I've said in email, I, I would be very grateful if the administration can update the charts and the graphs and the visual components of the presentation we saw and keep that as a running updated uh, current um, visual representation of what's going on in the county. Um, Is that I, get, I get confused by different charts and people saying this and that. I'd, I'd like to see one consistent um, set of images about what those numbers are doing. So David, is that just That's the possible. county numbers? Is that just the county numbers? Because that presentation included state numbers and other data. Uh, I'm talking about the the charts that we have been updating um, from the emergency uh, meeting when we uh, the, the presentation given the night that we um, went to Plan C. Right, but are we only looking at the no local numbers, or we don't want the whole presentation? <laughs> Just the, the core data that's valid to Cabarrus County. David, may I jump in? This is yep. Holly. Are you talking about the information that was coming out from Brian Schultz? If you are, that's what I was this. Uh, that's what I was referencing as well. Is that what you yeah. were talking about? Yes. I okay. And those, I agree. Uh, that, that's I really good those, information. I just want to see those same charts updated with weekly numbers. Nothing right. More. And, right. So, and with that, I would like if we could break out the hospitalization number just a little bit more to show exactly what's just Cabarrus County res residents. That would be great. What the the um, the Health Alliance reported today is that 16 of those are, if you just say you want only people that live in Cabarrus County, they're reporting 16 of those. So, so Chris, I just want to make sure I heard you. I was a little override there with my phone. So 16, only 16 of those 51 are Cabarrus County residents? That's what, yes, that's what they reported today. Okay, great. Thank you. I think it's and important that we understand that Cabarrus County residents could be in the hospital in Charlotte or elsewhere. And we have employees from other counties who come into Cabarrus to work. So I don't know that we can focus on just where our residents are in the hospital. I know that's, that takes place in the other counties and they do keep up with the different counties too, but I for myself would like to have that. You may not want it, but and that's okay with me, but I would like to see that myself. Yeah, but it's numbers that the Cabarrus County Health Alliance provides, so it's certainly something that we can update on the chart, as long as what I had asked for before was the active cases. So. And and this, I, I'm only asking to, in my mind, keep it as, as simple as the original presentation was, as, as opposed to adding new data points. And I guess along, along what Mr. Harrison said, so we had the first meeting on Thursday. And we can always and we do update and send those to you guys based on Thursday numbers. I meet with the Health Alliance on Mondays and Thursdays. So I sent you guys updated information today because I meet with them, but we just won't send you anything on Monday anymore. We'll just send you Thursday and that way it'll be consistent. Chris, I just pulled up the Health Alliance at 609 just now, and it's got hospitaliz hospitalized residents of Cabarrus County, and it's showing 18, not 16, 18. That's well, again, this is part of what the problem is. Maybe what Mr. Harrison is saying is that you have data on Thursday when it's updated, then you have the weekend and it's updated on Monday when I send it to you guys after our meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. And since 10 o'clock in the morning till now, it may have been updated again. And so what I tried to do was send you the most updated, but all we're going to do now is just send it to you on Thursday, and that way you'll have week to week and it won't be confusing because you might click on it before this meeting is there and there may be two more that are in the hospital because they have been updating about two every two hours. So it's a constantly, you know, it, it's constantly updated. Yeah, it it, it's, a, it's a moving target. And I, I'm just asking for myself for a point in time and a consistent point in time that we pull the data and look at it. If there were a sudden spike up or down, that would warrant some additional discussion. But 
Um, uh, I, I'm not asking to add to or delete from the information that we have been accumulating and presenting. Except, I mean, weekly updates is all I mean. Yes, your your request is to keep the, the presentation updated. That is the, presentation. The, more, the PowerPoint presentation, just a new line in the graph. So, and Holly has, Holly has asked for additional information about hospitalizations, local, and I've asked for active cases to be provided to the board. So, can those be added to that presentation? Well, that, I mean, they can't be added to the presentation because we would just change it. But if you guys want us to report those in different format, we will. We'll just, again, we'll do that on Thursdays, and that way it'll stay consistent. Thank okay. you. And then our other question again is, do, do we want to meet next Monday or, or, or are we going to wait till we continue to get more information or more data? Well, Mr. Chair, the, the motion was to look at the data almost weekly, but at least every two weeks. So don't we need a, uh, a quick discussion about what the status is in those cycles? The motion says something about looking at the data from Thursday to make a decision on making having a meeting on Monday. Yeah, Mr. Shoemaker, maybe you can help us explain it a little bit better. Yeah, my, my thought was is that Dr. Louder had said that Thursday seemed to be the most accurate number that he was dealing with. So trying to dial that number in, I wanted to make sure in the motion that we were using Thursday's numbers um, as our as our benchmark and that we would revisit this at least every two weeks so that we could keep our eye on the ball knowing that it's going to take Dr. Ladder at least a couple of weeks to um, move the uh, the staff and everybody from, from the uh, option C to an option B or A. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think what Mr. Harrison's asking for is consistent uh, benchmarking information, which I believe Dr. Lauder in this discussion has said he would provide that every Thursday he would update it and so that gives us a point, gives the board the opportunity to look at the three pieces of information that are driving the uh, decision matrix for him and the health department and ultimately for us. Uh, one of them being the number of cases um, dropping over a two, two um, periods of uh, of incubation, which is a four week period, uh, a drop in the percentage of the te positive tests, which are currently at, based on what I was just looking at, around 7.75% to about 5%. And then the, um, there was a third one, Dr. Lauder. I, I was, Hospitaliz hospitalizations. The hospitalizations dropping. Um, overall hospitalizations. I don't believe we had a benchmark for Cabarrus County residents, but we did have a benchmark for our hospital and its ability to uh, handle cases. And they have dropped from, they had gone at the time we had our meeting in July, the cases were at 42. They spiked all the way up to 62, and now they're back down to 52 based on the, the website that I've seen in front of me. So um, those are the three things. And I believe that it would be good for us if Dr. Lauda would definitely uh, show those in the uh, the Thursday wrap up. So we would yeah, be. Yeah, so um, what my understanding was, this doesn't mean this is right, by the way, because I know some of this is confusing, but my understanding was that we were going to send you guys this um, at least once a week. Now we'll make that on Thursday. And then if there was a trend that you got, so in other words, you get it Thursday afternoon, Friday morning, whatever that, um, however you want to put that. And then if there was a reason to that you could call a meeting and come back together and and be able to say hey we need to to change that but i didn't i didn't know that you guys were talking about having three meetings a month now again i may have just misunderstood that but and then if no. there's a reason to you can you know say hey well let's have a meet let's have a call meeting because the date has changed and we need to look at it you know etc no the, the the and you're you're correct it would could technically be three meetings if we wanted it but the meeting on the 17th would be only if we felt there was a need to have a meeting to begin the process to uh, move from one option to another. Uh, so we would look at the data and then make an assumption on what we wanted to do at that point. So the, the biggest thing was to force us to stay engaged so that we could make meaningful decisions as quickly as possible to um, move from one 
one option to another, um, knowing that it's still gonna take time to make these changes. And for myself, Dr. Lauder, I'm willing to have five meetings a month if that's what it takes to keep me abreast of the data and to make a, a joint decision with the rest of the board. If I could jump in for some clarifications, please. Uh, so the I've been sending the last two Friday mornings, I've sent the, the updated data out based on trying to stay consistent with the end of the day on Thursday. Uh, when we had our emergency meeting, uh, I was really pushed to get that data up in, in the PowerPoint by the time that the meeting started at six o'clock, by, by how the all three of those sites that I pull from uh, update their data. So um, I can send it as soon as it's ready Thursday night, or I can continue to send it uh, every Friday morning. Um, either way, is it's not it's not a um, uh, in, in, inconvenience at all on me. So I just uh, so if there's a preference for that, I'd like to know. And then I think um, you know from what you're saying, if you're going to make a decision to have a meeting on Monday, it does sound like Thursday or Friday is the right timing. So if you see a significant you know, change, uh, downtick, uptick, whatever in the data, then you can shift very quickly and call a meeting uh, for Monday if that if that suits you. So I'll just can continue with the same pattern. I guess I just want a preference on uh, Thursday or Friday. And then to Ms. Grimsley's point, I will go. I can easily add um, the number of local hospital hospitalizations on there. OK, but we can you've also given us the link so we as board members can check that at any time. Is yeah, the links are yes. The links are I always put those in the body of the email, so yeah, you can look at what what's current. You know, the, the interesting thing is that when you go back and you know, report a number from the prior week, let's say the number is eighteen hundred of ca cases the prior week, when you go back a week later and look at that, it might say eighteen sixty three, because the the health alliance and the state keep adding to those totals. So if there was a delay in a result that they didn't get until a couple days later. And it wasn't able to be added in that day. So these numbers are always moving. Um, it's, it's very like like one time I looked back and thought that I'd made a mistake on transposing the number when and then I you know look they continue to update the data uh, as we go along. So um, I just you know I I try to take one point in time which is you know Thursday evening Thursday afternoon Thursday evening and I'll always pull at that specific time. So then there's no question about. Well, you pulled that 12 hours later and that's that's why it's different so i'll always pull at the same exact time every day okay i just if we're are we making a data dri driven decision we kind of need to know what the target is that's right. or if it's just a trend or if it's uh, you know, what how, what number of hospitalizations are we okay with what percentage we've already said what percentage of testing is under five well what number of cases do we have we even thought about that i mean if you look at the active cases those numbers have gone down for the last two weeks yeah, but the active cases, we were talking about four weeks, which is two incubation periods. So you're looking at the cases declining for a total of 28 days. Okay, so we have we have half of that. Right. And then you're looking at the tests. Once the tests below drop to 5% or below, then that is another hurdle. As far as the hospitalizations, I think the big, the big difference is, is that the hospitalizations we were at 90% and uh, we know with, uh, in our discussion with uh, Ms. Rodriguez um, mm -hmm. that they had the capacity to go up to 200 beds, but their issue was staff, getting enough staff to handle it. Now they surged up to 62, so they must have been able to find some way to get staff on a temporary basis because now they're back down to 52, which puts them somewhere near their 100% mark. Uh, what we would want to see is that the number of cases is continuing to drop in the hospital along with the other two indexes that we saw. I don't think we have any exact measures on the hospitalization. I don't think that one was the, the biggest driver, except that it needed to be go showing downward trajectory as well. That's the only issue there, uh, only observation there. So Barry, let me just chime in. This is Holly, <clears throat> and I agree with all that. The one, the only reason I want to take that just one step further, and as Brian said, and thank you, Brian, for making that clarification, that that is easily done to put to extract the Cabarrus County residents because it is important to me. We are only responsible for our Cabarrus County residents and our Cabarrus County school children. I don't. I mean, it's. I don't want to see anybody in the hospital, but the number I want to focus on 
and I want this in the report, is the number of Cabarrus County residents are. I get it that we have Cabarrus County residents in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, some others, not very many. And they stay here, of course, because we are a hub. We are, are one of the hubs. So it is important to me to see that number extracted from that number of hospitalizations because we were at X number a couple of weeks ago when we had this discussion. That number was at 21 of Cabarrus County residents. Now it was down to 16. I guess we we went back up to 18. But that number is important to me, and I would like to see that included. Right. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I was not debating, I'm not debating that. Um, I was asked about the criteria. It is really what I was focusing on. One of the things that we have to keep in mind, we keep focusing on, and, and, I, and I heard this anecdote today, there was a school that was in session and 28 of the staff got exposed to some type of COVID and now they're all out for two weeks of quarantine. Some have COVID, some don't, but the, that is the reality that we face is if we have it, we could lose a substantial portion of our staff fairly quickly just, just due to the two week quarantine. And so um, that's, that's why we're trying to be judicious in what we're doing because the last thing we want to do is start school up and then turn right back around and have to shut it down because we had a bunch of COVID cases that um, people either got exposed to it or actually have it. And now we had to shut the whole school back down because of lack of staff to support teaching. And so that was part of the thinking that went into why I went the direction that I went. Well, which is why we have the, why we have this data to look at. But I mean, we all want to get our kids back to school. At what point do the numbers tell you it's it's reasonable or safe to do so? Well, the CDC has came out on Friday after our board meeting and said that five percent. I mean, in the in the um, interview with Dr. Chris, what was it, Dr. Ladder? What was that fellow's name? Dr. Or Ahmed? Um, Dr. Coyle is the health alliance. No, I'm talking about the one from uh, CDC, the head guy, Res Resfield or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, it, that's, but that number lags by two weeks, doesn't it? Well, that's because of the testing number. And I know that the governor's as frustrated by the testing number as everybody else because, you know, we all know that we're we're looking in the rearview mirror trying to drive forward and, and, and we're looking two miles behind us rather than a mile ahead of us or even looking at over the hip over the, the hood. We're not even looking over the hood right now. So that is frustrating. And that's, I think that everyone recognizes that, but it's the only thing we have at this point to guide us. Yeah, it is important to say it doesn't, um, what they were reporting, if you looked at the Health Alliance, was the beginning of the week, meaning like it would say July 26, even though August 2nd was the end of the week or whatever that would translate to. So they did change that based on our request. So now if you look at August 1st, their data goes through August 1st, and that's essentially a week behind. The next one that they'll post will be August 8th, and that, that is because of how long it takes to do the test. So it's not two weeks behind, but it is a behind by a week. So the other yeah, thing. Yeah, well, now I, it's catching up. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Laura. Just I want to point out that, you know, some of these schools, um, Barry, like the one that you were talking about, these 28 people that were exposed, if they were maintaining social distancing and they were wearing PPE, then there, there shouldn't have been that kind of um, great exposure going on. So that means that they weren't doing their due diligence um, with each other, making sure that they were wearing their masks and things. So I think we need to take that into consideration too, because I've seen pictures of schools in Georgia that are just wide open where the kids are just walking down the hallway all next to each other. And so we're not, we're not talking about at this point, at least opening up schools in that, in that manner. So um, I'm not sure where that school was of the 28 people that were um, all exposed, but I know that not everyone is opening the schools the same way that we are are doing. So to use those examples, if they're not going to do it the way we're doing it, then probably it's not really um, going to be a, a, the same situation. But people are going to have to use their own personal um you know, it's it's going to be it's going to be if you're not going. I mean, if you're going to come to the school and not wear your mask and and expose yourself, and then you might actually get exposed. Then I mean, there comes a, a point where that's not the onus is not on us for that. It's on them. Right, but there and this is this is where Dr. Louder and um, Ms. Jones will have to. You know, deal with them with the employees on an employee basis, 
and 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 employee havers as far as PPE. You know, in past lives, when I've been in an industrial environment, when you, you are told you wear safety shoes and you wear eyeglasses and you wear earplugs, you, you, there was progressive discipline that went when you didn't perform those activities. And I think that, that they'll have to deal with those in, internally as to how they're going to enforce these mechanisms. But I agree with what you're saying. People need to protect themselves. But if we're providing PPE, PPE and and saying that this is the way you have to perform when you're on your job, then you need to perform the way you're this way when you're on your job because it becomes a condition of employment. So, okay. So, does the data not show us we need we need to revisit this on Monday, or are we going to wait to the first our work session in September? I think you wait till Thursday or Friday and and do as the motion said. Thursday or Friday, you look at the data. If the data looks like it's vastly improved and there's really reasons to come and have an emergency meeting, then we will. But I think that's what you wait for. That's why I structured it the way I did is so that we can move and be a little bit more nimble because yeah. after after next Monday, then, you know, there's schools going to schools going to open on Monday. But after next Monday, you just allow two weeks to go by to see if you have a better understanding of the data. And then we'll have go into our next uh, work session and we can make some decisions there without an emergency meeting. But it was at least give us thinking about it. Mr. Chair. Yeah, David. Just kind of a kind of a point of order. Does that Thursday to Monday cycle give us enough time to comply with open meetings laws? It does. If we make the decision by Friday. Mm -hmm. What I and I think it's important for all of us to understand that. Once we see a trend, we have to sustain the downward trend. It can't keep going back over the line um, of that 5%. So we need to um, just make sure we understand it's a sustained trend. Okay, so Chris, you understand what data you're gonna provide us? Perhaps you're muted. Yeah, I think we're still, you just asked to essentially add the hospitalizations part and then as we said we'll send that to you on friday um with and, and, the, and the active cases are you already doing that yeah but we'll we'll add active cases to um what i'm not sure if that's what um the chart that brian updates on the presentation but we can add both of those it's not on there but i'll, I'll add it and i'll go back a few weeks just so we have a, a trend thank you all right so i'll hand it off to uh, dr ladder to uh, superintendent comments all right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we began the 2021 school year as students at early colleges and teachers for all of our other schools began the school year. Schools will host their virtual open house events this week for students and families and distribute Chromebooks to all the students. So please visit your school's website for dates, times, and details if you haven't already done so. Last week we announced that we would continue to delay the start of summer workouts until we receive further direction from the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. The High School Athletic Association has not discussed dis canceling sports for the year. However, discussions are taking place regarding the timelines for all the seasons. As soon as the timelines are made available to us, then we'll be able to make the best decision possible. We are eager to have student athletes return to playing fields and courts, but only when it's safe to do so. We certainly appreciate everybody's support and patience as we um, wait on the Athletic Association to provide some guidance. Our students and staff continue to make us proud and represent the district well. Congratulations are in order for the 2020 Cabarrus Soil and Water Conservation Contest winners and Envirothon teams. The Cabarrus Soil and Water Contest had more than 2,400 students participate for the 1920 school year. Students learned about the wetlands in Cabarrus County and around the state with the theme Wetlands Are Wonderful. 28 Cabarrus County school students placed in the various contest categories. We want to congratulate Mount Pleasant Middle School teacher Ashley Miller, who was named Cabarrus Soil and Water Conservation District Teacher of the Year. Congratulations also go out to Central Cabarrus High School Family and Consumer Science teacher Carol Parrish, who received the 2020 Everlene Davis Award from the North Carolina Department of Public Education at the NC at the North Carolina CTE Summer Conference. The Everlene Davis Award is presented to a teacher who has made a lasting impact on the North Carolina family and consumer science education. Ms. Parents has more than 20 years teaching family and consumer science. Finally, I want to add that even though this year is starting out like no other, it's still a new school year full of promise and possibilities, and today's a very exciting day as we welcome the faculties back. 
I'm very confident we have the right people and processes in place to make this year a success, no matter what plan we're operating under. It is important for us to work together, support one another, and lean on each other because we're all in this together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Ladder. Uh, we'll move on to Section 8, which is guest speakers. And uh, Ms. Abbott, did we, did we get any requests? We had one, and Brian Shaw, our board attorney, is going to read it. Okay, Brian. Yeah, let me uh, got to put my hands on that. Okay. Okay, Rob, can you hear me? I can. I can uh, see it. This, yes, this is an email from Melissa Black. Good afternoon. I would like the board to discuss a solution for the families that have poor or no internet in their homes. Solutions like upgrading service, adding on to an already existing plan, putting our kids in daycare, finding a church or business that offers a place with internet, passing blame or solutions on others down the line is not the answer. Why? Number one, if my kids are attending a place with lots of other children in the same need as mine is not social distancing. It totally goes against the whole remote learning and staying away from the other families or kids. From your lips, not mine, quote, we can't go to school because it kills, close quote. So this is not the answer. Number two, transportation. My kids ride the bus. Who is getting them there and back from daycare or internet offering facilities? So this is not the answer. Number three, money. It costs to add extras to my already existing plan. It costs to put them in an already full to the max centers to help with internet service. It costs to take time from work to run kids to and from locations. Most people live on a tight budget and you can't expect to add this expense to them. So this is not the answer. Number four, my teachers and principals have other things to do the last few days before, I assume school starts, it says before starts. Working on education on computers, apps, or programs to be educated enough to help a child in need. They're working on a new style of meeting and greeting their new students, working on new lectures or ways to educate our children. So this is not the answer. Simple answer is to open schools. One or two days a week in a class is better than what you are suggesting. Otherwise, find a solution for equal education for all students. Thank you, Melissa. And that's Melissa Black. Okay, thank you to Ms. Melissa Black for sharing her concerns. Um, no other speakers? All right. We will uh, move on to our action agenda. Well, actually, no, we'll move on to our approval of the consent agenda, which is 9.01. And we have a number of policies, and we also had the approval of the beginning teacher support plan. Board members, any, we're still okay with those on consent? If so, we'll need a motion and a, and a second to approve that, our consent agenda. So moved. This is Holly. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Ms. Grimsley and second by Ms. Furtenbaugh. Any further discussion on our consent agenda? All right. All in favor of approving our consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed say no. Okay, our consent agenda passes. And we will move on to our action agenda. We have a couple items there. And our first item is 10.01 approval of policy 3620 extracurricular activities and student organizations. And Mr. Schultz or Ms. Burns, are you on, on with us? Hi, good evening again. I'll go ahead and share the screen for that policy so that you have that. Thank you. Chairperson Walter, can you see that okay? We can. Okay, great. You want to review the changes again with us? Sure. So the extracurricular uh, activity and student organization policy essentially um, added some wording here at the bottom of page two, uh, top of page three, to ensure that the communication mediums that were used for all non-curricular organizations could be used by all, uh, essentially. And uh, there were a couple of minor uh, changes further down. 
um, just some header uh, changes, and then one last change on the uh, appeals process. So I know this can't, this we had some uh, discussion on this last week. It was requested to be put on action item. Uh, so I just ask at this time, are there any further clarifications or questions or, or requests? Mr. Chairman, my questions were answered sufficiently, so I'd like to make a motion to approve. Okay. We have a motion to approve by Ms. I'll Furman. second that. A second by Mr. Shoemaker. Okay. Any further discussion on this item? Okay, let's vote on this, this item. All in favor of the approval of policy 3620? Please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed say no. Okay, that motion passes. And we're on to item 10.02, which is the approval of policy 4600 student fees. Okay, thank you, Chairperson Walter. Uh, again, policy code 4600 student fees had some su substantial uh, additions to this uh, based on Mr. Shaw, uh, our board attorney, uh, his review of uh, other districts uh, and the uh, legislation that was in place. And so the re recommendations uh, were, as you see in red, so substantial. Uh, what we did decide at the last meeting was to uh, eliminate D uh, about late fees. Uh, and we did have some uh, significant discussion on that as well. So. Uh, Mr. Shaw, I'll turn it over to you if, if you have any additional comments uh, that I left out. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Uh, I just wanted to uh, remind uh, the board of the, the basic concept. It's kind of hard to follow with all the strikeouts, but uh, the policy previously required Board of Education approval of all fees, even school level fees, but that was not being done in practice. And so we aligned the policy to, to the practice. Board would approve under this provision, would uh, approve all school level, school district level fees. Principals would approve all school level fees with review by the superintendent to ensure uh, consistency. Uh, the district level fees would be sent to the state department of public instruction as required by law but the uh, local school level fees would not because that's being that'd be approved at below the board level uh and so that's the general concept be glad to entertain any discussion about it mr right. Chair go ahead mr chairman the only uh, only thing i would like to see changed is under item B, the last sentence where it says any fee charged above the maximum student's fee amount will require, and it says super, superintendent's approval. I would rather that sentence say board approval, and that's only for maximum amount. Anything under that, the superintendent can approve. But if it's over the maximum amount, I think the, it should that should come back to the board and the board should approve anything over maximum amount. And I would rather that say board approval. Now that's just a suggestion for me. I would rather that say board approval for maximum amount. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But everything else is OK. And like say, if it's under that amount, Fine, superintendent can and the you know the state, but that one I'd like to say board. Okay, so you all are saying that the superintendent or his designee can um, determine the maximum amount, just like we set many years ago. We set five hundred dollars as the max for band and cheerleading and whatnot. Um, but if it goes over the max of whatever the superintendent decides, then it comes back to us, so we wouldn't play any part in the maximum amount determination. Right. Correct. If but if it's something that goes over that maximum amount, then it's got to come to us. You know, if there's some big trip or something that's really an absorbent amount and goes over the maximum they have asked, I think we need to know about that. 
and I think it needs to be approved by us. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Harrison. A kind of a point of order. If we would go ahead and take a motion to approve in a second, we could have discussion and friendly amendments and however we'd like to proceed. I, I, I certainly agree with Ms. Uh, Carpenter's uh, addition there. It's, it's a fine addition to the uh, policy, but we'd like to get it in a uh, in the normal order of discussion of uh, approval. Okay. Um, I also sent, had some comments and I sent an email to y'all. Did y'all get that? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we couldn't tell what was changed though. So. Ms. Burns made a, an adjustment. <clears throat> Is that something we can put up on the, the board doc? Or Brian, can you see it? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The email that I sent earlier this afternoon with some suggested changes or adjustments to this policy. Uh, did you get that? Yes, I did. Give me just a minute. Right. I'll see if I can. Again, Brian, I'm I, okay I, with I, taking a motion. We're, we're this, having this discussion so outside can... of the normal order. Mr. Shaw, do we need a motion and a second? Uh, the standard procedures to have a motion and a second uh, and then discussion. Uh, the board can, you know, as an informal board can do otherwise, but I think if a board member would like that standard procedure, we should follow the standard okay. procedure. Okay. I'm fine with that. Uh, do we have a motion? And a second? I'll make a motion that we, uh, uh, should I say approve with the change? Or I'll say a motion with the change I made. And I'll second to have a discussion and go forward. Okay, so we have a motion by Ms. Carpenter and a second by Mr. Harrison of approving this policy mm -hmm. with the addition of superintendent or board approval instead of superintendent approval at the end of section B. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask if, or do we need a second? We have the second, right? We do. So we're. Okay. I'd like to ask from the board members who are on the policy committee who was present at the meeting when this was discussed. I was. I was not. Who are our other policy members? Or Mr. Harrison and Mr. Walter? I was not. A, I was not in attendance. You were not at the meeting. Correct. Mr. Harrison, you were. Yes, okay. One of the meetings. What I don't like, board members, is when we have a committee <clears throat> that we have representation on, and we have all these school principals and county office people, whatnot, participating, and then we come and we re redo at the last minute a policy. Is this, so, a first, is this a first read or a second read? It's a first read. It's first read, I think. First read. But, but we already had it. We okay. already re had it a week or at least five days prior to the last meeting. It's just a frustration that we're not following our own procedures when we have designated representatives <clears throat> on the, the committee. Okay, thank you for that. There's comments um further discussion on this policy otherwise i'd like to brian if you can bring up this yes i do i do have it now should be able to see it can yeah can you make it a little bit bigger so the, so the items in green i've added some of those to make it read better and make it more clear uh, in the first paragraph, because on section B, we have requiring principals to submit uh, to the superintendent by the August board meeting. So why is that even there if we're not approving something at the August board meeting? Um, so that's why I have that um, or suggested that. And going down to B, if we're giving up our uh, authority to approve these fees, I think it should at least say why or what what we intend and the comment there was to ensure fees are held to a minimum, are consistent across schools, and are non-discriminatory. Um, that essentially was was the changes that I made. I also agreed with Ms. Uh, Carpenter uh, regarding the superintendent. If it exceeds the uh, the level that 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 can back to the board. Does anybody, does anybody object to us holding fees at a minimum to be consistent across schools or be non-discriminatory? I think it's, first of all, I think it's hard to do apples um, to apples across schools in some areas. 
So one school may have a big auditorium, may be able to do grander productions. And then you have another school that has a very small auditorium or a lecture hall and they can't do certain things. So I, I don't think you can do the consistency. I think you just have to deal with the maximum. This is Brian Shaw. Uh, <clears throat> you'll note that continuing on down on paragraph B, it says uh, the superintendent or designee will re will review uh, to ensure that school level fees are substantially consistent. That's the language we used at the bottom of that paragraph. And I don't know if if Mr. Walter's use of the word consistent is designed to be any different or whether it's just stating substantially consistent would be fine with fine with me. <clears throat> and that would be avoid avoid any difficulty in interpretation. And I think it addresses Ms. Ferdinand's uh, concern as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think we can just leave the original sentence that is later on in that paragraph B. So I, I'm OK with the but to ensure fees are held to a minimum, but I think we may address that elsewhere. You know, I think it makes it clear for the board and this is what the board wants. So if the board wants that, that's fine. Otherwise, you put it, it, back, it actually put is it in letter back, it makes it more confusing. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it's already in letter A. If you go up to letter A, it says we'll ensure that student fees are held to a minimum. It's already there. Yeah, we have different things. We have system level fees and we have school level fees. We're talking about two different things. Anybody else want to weigh into this? Or I don't want to take all night with it. But. So, Rob, this is Holly. I guess help me understand where where is give give me an example of what you think represents one of these that you would have an issue with. What do you mean? So why, what why, fee, why, I put the, why, why I suggest that we add these or is that right? Which which fee would you think would be getting changed that you would have an issue with? Can you give us like an example? I, I don't know, but if we're paying, if I'm a parent at one school and I'm paying a hundred bucks for something, and I'm a, if you know you'd want to make sure that if I'm paying something similar to that, it's going to cost the same, no matter if I'm at a school on the west side of the county or the east side of the county. And how do they know that? They don't know that unless we ensure that that doesn't happen or the superintendent ensures that that doesn't happen. I guess the only thing I'm trying to uh, think about is, so if you're at just for instance, Mount Pleasant High School and there's a fee for whatever and they have contributions from somewhere that helps take care of some of those fees, it might be different and if you're at another school and they don't, and then they have to set that fee schedule a little bit differently to compensate. I mean, I, I, I if we're talking school level fees versus uh, at large fees, I mean, I'm, I'm not real sure that I get it, that we would always have total control. In other words, okay, so let's, I'm thinking, where is it that, you know, I, I've gotten several emails about the uh, Chromebooks, the, fee that's being assessed for those that so a system, that's a system level fee is it not right so that's what i'm saying we pretty much evidently that is somewhere that we would have control over that i didn't even see that fee schedule so where is that at you know so i'm thinking where how are we going to get this information if you're going to if, if we're going to uh, state how we expect it to be um I guess the same across all that. How are we get? Are we going to get a monthly report? Are we going to get an annual report? How are because I I wasn't even aware of that fee. So well, that, how that how are we? Getting our, the, that was part of our discussion last month that we didn't want the board didn't want the, to see those fees. So if the board doesn't want to see those fees, we have some way we have to ensure that they're. 
But I guess that's my whole reason for asking the questions. If we're not going to see those fees, then how would we know if they were accurate or being assessed, as you say, equally? Essentially, you're leading that to your superintendent. And that's where you have the problem. Is that what you're saying? I don't have a problem. I just thought that that language should be added to be clear. Now, what the goal, goal of the board would be if we're going to give give up our authority to set these fees. Does that make sense? It does, and I I, I get it. I always thought that there we had a, a schedule that you know. Of course, I haven't seen you know those for several years, but I just assumed that we had schedules when they were system fees versus individual campus fees that we got those in a you know a certain time of the year or you know what i'm not sure if y'all have still been getting that or not but we I just guess reviewed those a couple months ago on some of those but it didn't cover all the fees so that's why this well, this policy breaks saying. breaks that up that's okay. what i'm saying but if, if is that what you're saying that you want it like when we got that report did you want it collectively all of it at the same time so that you're looking at individual schools versus just a system-wide fee. I guess that's where I'm getting lost in, I mean, in what my, pre my preference would have been to see all those fees, but in, is, in the event that we cannot see all those fees, that's why that language is in there or suggested. I mean, how can we ensure that they're charged correctly or, or whatever the methodology is if we don't see the fees? But you're talking individual campus fees in, in conjunction. Well, section, section B has to do with individual campus fees, correct? Right, but I guess I'm talking about, you're talking about verbiage in a policy. I'm talking about how are we going to receive the information in a report or how you're talking about verbiage in this policy. I, I'm saying staff's still going to give us a report every year for the system, well, system fees. Then right. how, right, so then how are we going to get the individual schools that you're asking about making sure that those are consistent or or not we're not asking we're not getting that it does not say in this policy that the board will get a list of all those fees right but i guess that's my question to you then how do how do we achieve what you're trying to do well, we set in policy that we want fees held to a minimum we want them to be consistent across schools and we want them to be non-discriminatory All right, Barry's got his hand raised. Do you want to add to this? Barry, you're muted or I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm trying to be a good a good media citizen. <laughs> Can I hear you now? <laughs> Sorry about that. Couldn't couldn't get back to my mic fast enough. Um, reviewing the system wide fees. I guess we do every year, I believe is uh, something that the board should and continu should continue to do as it's doing now. As far as the delegation of school level fees, I think it's a, a rabbit hole that we would go down. And I think that we now become in the middle of a lot of local decision, a lot of small decision making because fees may not, uh, Dr. Ladder gave some examples but uh, fees could pop up at the last minute, trips could pop up and literally be waiting on a board to act before the trip could be approved, which they, you know, if they envision the trip the week after work session, then it wouldn't come on to the board meeting or a day after the work session or even the Friday before the work session, then you'd be waiting an entire month and a, and a week before you could get the fee approved which means that the entire trip is on in doubt because now everybody's on hold waiting for the board to act. And I think that's, I think the board then becomes an encroachment on the ability of the school to move somewhat nimbly, even though it, it takes time to move nimbly, still adding five weeks to the nimbly process just, just makes it worse for school administrators. So I'm not in favor of making changes to the delegation of school level fees. I believe that's what the do Dr. Lauder and his team are there for to try to keep a, keep those things in line. And uh, I believe occasionally they could report out to us on what maximum level fees and maybe once a year they could report out and say, all right, here were the maximum level fees that were charged 
or in excess of the maximum that I approved. So at least we would know about those. Those could actually be included in a, in a, in the weekly report uh, at some point in time. But, but I don't believe that if we get into delegate, if we get into approving school level fees, I think we're, we're drifting into an area of oversight that will be difficult to manage and, and create a, a bureaucratic nightmare for the school administrators and their ability to, to make um, somewhat decently quick decisions on opportunities that they may find for their uh, for the students and, and the uh, charges that they have in their care. You, you make a good point here. I don't see anywhere where that allows them to make those last minute adjustments to fees. It says each principal is required to submit a list of fees to the superintendent prior to the August board meeting. Doesn't say they can make an adjustments during the, during the year. Yeah, this is Brian Shaw. Uh, it doesn't address that. And so since it doesn't address it specifically, I would think it would be implicit that they can adopt throughout the year fees that come up. But uh, these are more, this would apply more to the fees that are predictable, are going to be set in advance of the year. I mean, we could we could add some language to that effect, but I don't I, I think it's implicit. OK. Cindy, did you have your hand up? Or Barry, I'm sorry, did you? Is that everything? Well, I, I, I just I, I caution the board on getting involved in minutia. We have enough to deal with rather than to get ourselves involved and force Dr. Louder and his team to constantly have to bring things in front of us where we scrutinize small details that really uh, are left to his team to deal with. But we can deal with the more pressing needs that we have for the district and making sure that we spend our time talking about those decisions because it's easy to get trapped in these small rat ho ra rabbit holes and and get down into detail and and all of us are numbers people so we always get gravitate to that and we could lose so much time doing those types of things and that's not where our focus needs to be we're an oversight board not not the managing board if, if that's so we have oversight responsibility and and we can get our oversight taken care of through reporting and that type of thing rather than us actually making decisions. And I agree. I actually agree with that. OK, um, Cindy, did you have your hand raised? Uh, yes, I just said and I'm going to say Mr. Shoemaker said it beautifully. Um, I think we need to be careful about getting into the details, um, especially when you're looking at uh, the red section is itemized one three six there. Um, to try to manage the change, and I'm going to use an example of a school play. If one of the schools decides to put on a musical for which they have to obtain a license, the admission to that play may double on the fees, and parents were probably very likely willing to pay the $12 as opposed to the normal five or six dollars. So I think we need to let schools decide and let the principals manage their campus. Um, even things like concession sales, I don't even think that should be on the list. That's usually a, a PTO boosters club type thing. Um, I think we need to be very cautious of the minutia, as Mr. Shoemaker said so well. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else have comments on this? Okay, there was a motion and there was a second. Any further discussion? Uh, again, I still feel very strongly about this because the maximum is going to be the highest and the superintendent can set that and the 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 uh, principals can set that. I'm saying anything above that and I still feel very strongly about that and I think it should be the board that decides that and I don't see any problem with that and that is our prerogative to do that and uh, I don't think it's anything out of the ordinary for us to do that and um, I 
I just feel like it's something that we should have the authority to do. And yeah, anything, Mrs. Say, Mrs. And, Carpenter, I was just going to say, I agree with you on the high end of fees. And I think the maximums just need to be set accordingly. I just don't want us to get into all of these little things that we don't care what they charge for popcorn, quite honestly, at the concession stand. So I'd almost like to see that concession stand line be removed. But um, if people want to pay $40 for a sweatshirt with the school's logo embroidered, go for it. We don't care. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, the motion and the second was made with with Ms. Carpenter's initial uh, you you are you are correct, Mr. Harrison. So and and that I, and Cindy, I agree with that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if something as you mentioned about the ban, five hundred dollars mm -hmm. being the minimum. But if here we come and somebody one school says, Oh no, I want the ban to be two thousand. Yeah. That's something that we need to know. This is the type of thing I'm referring to, and that should come to the board. If one of the schools say, mm -hmm. our new school says, oh, no, we want to charge each parent $2,000 instead of 500 I think our board should be aware of something like that. Now, that's not happening, but I'm saying yeah, if that I agree with you. the case, okay. we should be aware of that, and we should our okay. board Carolyn, we, that isn't that isn't your motion that that the super that, that the board will approve that we would approve that that's was correct. my motion that's a, that's that was motion. the only change that you know that was my motion and I, I think we should have a little little more language to be more clear but anyway at this point let's we have a motion we have a second we've had our discussion so let's vote on this issue all in favor of the motion please say aye aye, aye. Anybody opposed say no. I will be a no. no. Yeah. Who is the other no? Barry. Okay, so Barry and myself were no's. So that motion passes five to two. We'll move on. Uh, thank you, members of the board. We'll make the, uh, the noted change at the bottom of section B and uh, we'll get a copy of that to you. So again, that's still first read. So it still does go back to the policy committee for a continued review. All right, um, 10.03, which is approval of school nutrition bids of Mr. Legrand and Ms. Almond. Are you on, on with us? Yes, good evening, everyone. Terrific. So um, we began last week with the uh, North Carolina Purchasing Alliance renewals. Um, requested some additional information, which we sent over. Um, we did break out the um, food and supplies just to be a little bit more consistent because those actually are separate bids. Can you uh, and, kind of show it to us? Oh, sure. Let me, let me pull up the right one. Can you see that? Um, yes. I can make it a little bit larger. I know it's harder to see on Teams. So in the past, they have um, food and supplies have been combined, but it's just a little bit more accurate since they actually are separate bids. And I think it gives you a little bit more information. So it did pull out food and supplies. Um, and then of course we had the produce. So um, food and supplies was won by Gordon Food Service. Um, renewal is the fourth year of the allowable four years of renewal. And the totals, uh, which you have the spreadsheets as well in your documents, um, food is $3,194,140.03. And supplies is $419,061.93. Before I move on to produce, I wanted to stop and see if you had any questions. Board members? Yes, you can continue. Okay. And so produce was the fourth year as well with our renewal with RH Produce Company. And the bottom line for that bid was $360,000, $360,867.09. Any questions on produce? Only and I can go ahead. The only question I have. I know that when we talked at our meeting last month 
I mean, last week, you were still waiting to hear if you heard any more about the extension of the food program uh, past the 31st of this, I mean, the end of the month. Have you heard anything about, you know, the food program or anything? Yes, we have. Um, USDA has denied the request to continue the summer food service program through the remainder of the year. So that program will end on August 31st. However, we will continue serving um, um, throughout the entire school year, regardless of what plan we're after. So we are currently working with um, our consultants at DPI uh, to have a full plan in place with how we're going to proceed after uh, September 1st. Okay, so but we, so we so we'll do some type of food service. Uh, so will it be? So you don't know yet what it'll be. It'll be what it'll look like then. It'll be very similar to what we have right now. There'll be some internal changes and there'll be some some external changes. And all of those external changes, we're confirming a little bit on um, some which waivers are still in place so that we're sure of what we are able to offer. And then once we have a firm grasp on that, we'll be publicizing um, any changes to make sure our school community is well informed of what's going to be available. Oh, okay. So we may not have as many sites available as what we had before. I hope saying? we won't be reducing the number of sites. That's I, I hope at the very least we will have um, certainly our school sites um, and we'll see firmly within the coming days uh, what that is going to look like exactly. But we're hoping not to reduce uh, any school sites and maybe just reconfigure a bit so that we can continue to serve the students so that they have a place to go and obtain lunch while they're doing their remote learning. Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, and then number two is the renewals of the following local bids. Again, these had no price increases and uh, we included um, as requested the documents showing how the bids were initially awarded. So the temporary staffing services through a uh, local company, Jennifer Temps, our third of four uh, years of renewals. Frozen yogurt novelties, once we're able to offer that, um, as a a la carte item through another local company, Innovative Concessions is in our second renewal year. Uh, milk through uh, Paul D. Campbell Distributors. Renewal is the first year that we're able to renew of four possible years. And then chemicals is through Alco Soap and Supply, uh, also the first year of renewals. So any questions on the local bids? We have some hand raised. And Mr. Harrison was first, and Mr. Furtenbaugh. Hey, Ms. Uh, Allman, um, just a kind of general procedural question about, for example, the temporary staffing services. We're in yes. renewal year three of four. Are we about to begin discussions or negotiations about year four of four or how to proceed? How, when do we begin the cycle of addressing the next wave of of a brand new contract, I guess, um, as we're coming up uh, in time to the fourth year of a fourth year, four year contract. In this case, I'm just asking how far ahead do we start planning? Sure. Um, if there are any issues with vendors, um, those are dealt with all along um, so that the, we have no unresolved issues going into the bid renewal period. Typically, bid renewal st starts around February. Um, and if everything is agreeable, if we've had no unresolved problems with any vendors and we have renewals available according to the bid contract, I will, it, it can either be the vendor or the district will reach out to one another, see if the other party is agreeable under the terms. If they are, we um, will go ahead and do whatever paperwork is required and proceed on. If neither party is agreeable to a renewal, then we know early enough that we can go ahead and put out a new bid for the following school year. So typically February is around the time that we start that process. And, and that gives other competitors enough time to jump on and, and get in the mix uh, of making bids? Yes, absolutely. In the case of North Carolina Procurement Alliance bids, 
those are there's not very many vendors and so we try to let them know as an alliance which districts are going out for bid on which lots pretty early so that they can be prepared and reach out to us and then local bids i keep a file throughout the year we'll get <laughs> From time to time companies who want to bid next time we come up for bid and so i just keep a file so that i'm sure to include that vendor the next time i issue an ifb great thank you yes sir Ms. Fertenbaum? i mean i have a couple questions this is a follow-up and stephanie thank you for answering my questions earlier today yes ma'am um for teacher substitutes we don't have um, we don't pay a staffing agency a fee Mm -hmm. Can we possibly do school nutrition subs like we do teacher subs where we have people who are listed? Sorry, my clock is dinging here. <laughs> um, people who are designated as acceptable subs and uh, they are called upon when a sub is needed. It certainly is. Um a, a uh, option that we can definitely look into. From my understanding, um, I believe they went to this model and, and districts use both models across the state. There's not um, one in particular, but I believe that there were two reasons. One was because the um, staffing agencies were to be doing a, uh, a lot of recruitment um, that would take some of that off of us. Um, that has we, we have seen them do some recruitment so that has been good so they are tr in the process of trying to find us subs and secondly they do a lot of the training and um we do the food centric training and they do a lot of the training and vetting and and all of those things that ordinarily our hr department does for our current employees so they take um they take ownership of all of that but that's certainly something that um i think it's about time uh as we move into this last year of renewal that i will do some research on and see if that's still the best option for us and if it's not um find a way to um perhaps move to another model uh, we don't utilize a ton of subs um we have a pretty small sub list usually 10 or fewer because we try to um, utilize sending folks from one site to another if that's possible without leaving anyone else, you know, shorthanded. Um, so we try to keep that to a minimum, but definitely this last year I'll be looking into that to see if that's still the best model or if we need to change to a different model. Well, when you're talking about the last year, I don't believe we are required to renew for the fourth year. No, we're not required. That's exactly yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. So if it's feasible and I, you know, Glenda may know the cost analysis already of what it costs, but I'm just thinking, why would we pay a company for that when we have an HR department? So, um, and my last question okay. is, uh, or actually two more questions. One is on documents that have two, <clears throat> excuse me, two lines for people to sign. Yes. I would expect they are two different people that you said you don't have a check and balance process. To me, the very essence of that document is a check and balance because it lists two different people. So I I would prefer to see that there are two signatures. Two people have confirmed the data is correct and what is written on there is happening has happened. So that's certainly you can talk about with uh, Mr. Legrand, um, but that's my two cents when I see a document okay. like that. Sure, um, and, we, and we do have a check and balance process. It's not on that particular document, but that would not be a difficult thing to add to a, a document so we could have the signature of who checked um, the figures and the formulas and things like that. We, we do have the process and so we can add that to the document to have a confirmation. Okay, so I just, when I see that, I expect that it's two different people that have uh, confirmed the data. And the last thing is um, we had an, an inquiry, which I had previously sent to Dr. Louder, but just to make sure you're aware of it, um, that coordinating the lunch distribution timing with the curriculum and instruction schedules. Mm -hmm. So if the lunch is being delivered to that area at 115, but the curriculum and instruction says you're back being counted for attendance at one o'clock, then we need to, try to be in sync as much as we can. I know that's a very difficult thing to do all the, the food routes and have the kids back, but 
I think we do need to make our best effort on that. Yes, and um, Mr. Legrand did discuss that with me, and we are going to be working on that so we can make it as easy as possible on our families to come get lunch. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Carpenter had a question. Ms. Carpenter? Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm muted here. Yes, on your uh, chemicals, uh, yes. the soap and supplies. Uh, what kind of chemicals, you know, because we don't see what you, uh, you know, oh, what yes. we're getting, uh, you know, since we're looking at COVID and everything, are these soap or what, what? What are you actually getting from these individuals? Yes. So what we order from any kind of chemical supplier is a lot of dish machine products, such as the detergent, uh, the drying agent. Then we also order um, quad sanitizers, which are used on any food uh, prep surface or eating surface, such as the dining room tables and so on. Um, the items that you need such as um, the strips to test if the sanitizer is the correct um, the correct strength and then a variety of other things that are not chemicals per se but they go along with it so more janitorial things like um, sometimes mop heads or um, bar towels or um, um, oven mitts, things like that. So um, then we would also order things like floor cleaner and degreaser. So everything that's really just focused on the um, cleanliness and sanitation, it does have to meet certain requirements in order to be used. So we go with the manufacturer, uh, their recommendation, and then we go with what the um, uh, FDA recommends as far as sanitizing for food preparation surfaces. Because I, I, I just wonder, because I know that, especially now, sat, you know, all this germ-free stuff, I didn't know if this is what we're ordering from them, because I know it's hard to get it anywhere, and I didn't know if this was the type of stuff we were ordering from them, if, if we were able to get it from them, uh, if we have somebody that we get this type of thing, this type of, these type of items from, and are able to get it from these individuals. And that's entirely possible, and I can reach out to uh, Mr. Taylor and see if he's aware of this vendor to put him in touch with them to be sure that they have him, uh, that he has them down as a supplier for potentially those kind of items that we need in order to sanitize the schools. Because they had just said that those, sanit those wipes you see, that you're going to have a real bad shortage of those for the next six months, and nobody's going to be able to get those Clorox wipes and that if you can get yes. them you better be able to get you know try to get them so that's why I was curious about I've that that too yes ma'am thank you very much yes ma'am Ms. Ferdinand did you have another question yeah I just wanted to make a comment that um, Ms. Almond had already replied to me by way of email today um, but that these totals on uh, these quotes are simply projected totals they are not yes. we are not committed to spend all of that money so for example if we are not in full service school for six weeks two months whatever it is um, we are not committed to spending all of that money to each of these vendors is that correct absolutely okay. thank you for that clarification yes okay mr harrison you had your hand raised uh just on a lighter note um as a dishwasher in graduate school at a restaurant, I can appreciate the thoroughness of uh, Ms. Allman's team and her working through the numbers and providing the means of getting the cafeteria's uh, production as safe and sanitary as possible. So I appreciate all the work that you've got going on there. Thank I, you. Only, I only understand in an itty bitty bitty little way, but um, you're, you're working at a larger magnitude and it's, it's uh, tremendous work that keeps our kids safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, if we have no further questions, we'll need a motion and a second to improve, approve the uh, school nutrition bids as, as presented. So moved. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Second. Harrison. So, is that Ms. Blackwell? Yes, sir. Second by Ms. Blackwell to approve the uh, school nutrition bids as presented tonight. Um, any further discussion? All right, hearing none, let's vote. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed, say no. Okay, that motion passes seven 
Zero. That was the last item on our, our, our agenda today. I know Ms. Wagner is on the phone with us. Um, didn't give you an opportunity to speak. Is there anything you wanted to share with us or say before we end, end our meeting? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So with that, without any further items, we need a motion. We need a motion to adjourn tonight. Move to adjourn. Okay. A motion by Mr. Harrison. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Shoemaker. All in favor of adjourning tonight, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed say no. Okay, our meeting is adjourned. We want to thank the, the public for watch, watching with us, and we will see you uh, probably next month. Yay. Good night. Good night. Good night, all. Good night.